Just give me one second, sirs, because I uh, believe it's going to take a couple of minutes for it to come. Uh, though if you don't need a PowerPoint and you'd like to address the audience, feel free to start. <laughs> Otherwise, um, yeah, yeah, you're telling me, right? I, I Okay, that's great. Um, so yeah, so I think, uh, I think the fact that we keep getting new people uh, each time is, uh, I don't think they need to see me. They can, they can see me just fine. Please put their presentations. Um, yeah, yeah. So no, no. It, yeah, it's it's okay because I think uh, if we if we have a tight schedule, you might as well uh, talk more about the uh, uh, what's going to happen today. So uh, please come on stage and all all the chairs, please uh, let people see who is you know the driving force behind this momentous thing. And uh, in anticipation of the beautiful things to come, a round of applause for our. General chairs who have spent the last six months planning. So um, over to you. I'll make sure. Okay. Now I need to figure out how to filibuster until the <laughs> the, the slides show up. But uh, I want to thank uh, all of. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, in the audience for coming. This is a momentous comsnet. It's the fifteenth year, uh, and it's quite uh, wonderful that uh, uh, that you've all been able to make it. So uh, we have, we, I mean, I want to just start out with the, you know, f sort of few words about, uh, oh, okay, I need to, the world is, universe is telling me to stop. So I will stop until, uh, okay. yeah, somebody needs to mute, yeah. Testing, testing. Okay. Test. Okay, that's better. Okay, we're just waiting on the slides because you, otherwise you see two of me, like the giant me, or three. <laughs> three. I see. I see three of me. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, this is the momentous fifteenth year of Comsnet. That's amazing. So uh, at least the vision behind Comsnet that I heard, right, was. Uh, Start uh, starting out was just building a bridge between India and the world. So this is this was designed to be a conference around computer systems and networking uh, that uh, that is located in India, but it's a truly global conference. So our objective was to design a conference that that connects everybody around the world in and in the true spirit of networking uh, and creates a 
research environment and cultivates a rich research environment in India. So over the years, we've been lucky to have speakers from around the world, submissions from many countries from around the world. So I'm glad that we are continuing that tradition. So I'm really happy to have uh, Mon uh, Monisha Ghosh from the University of Notre Dame and Nilesh Mehta from IASC. I'm going to do most of the talking right now, and then you'll hear from them later as they introduce the speakers and so on. Uh, so, but before we begin, if you could, uh, oh yeah, here I have it. Yeah, uh, I want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge uh, Himanshu Gandhi. Uh, Himanshu Gandhi was uh, our social media co-chair. He's very young. He was a uh, he uh, is from IIT Delhi. Uh, he passed away uh, unfortunately due to health uh, for health reasons in the midst of uh, our conference planning. We in fact had uh, had uh, a conversation with him. We were and he was bustling with ideas for social media just a day before he was hospitalized and it was a big shock for all of us. So, uh, and he's been associated with Compsnets over the years, starting from being a volunteer to being a social media chair. So if we could take uh, a moment's silence, uh, if you could all rise for a moment uh, to acknowledge him just for a bit. All right, thank you, everyone. I appreciate that. All right, so uh, the backbone of Comsnets over the year has been our wonderful organizing committee. Now, this is a very long list of uh, of chairs that I uh, I'm going to go over uh, individually briefly uh, to acknowledge them. Uh, we really are thankful to all of them for the for the hard work. The most important bullet, the most important chairs are right at the very bottom. Uh, so the volunteers. Uh, who've been the backbone of Comsnets right from the beginning. So if you could all please give a round of applause to our volunteers, amazing volunteers. You see them all around lining up right here and there, everywhere, right? Uh, doing all of the work that you don't see, but they keep the conference running. So, so thank you all so much. Uh, so we have an amazing organizing team, uh, the TPC co-chairs. So we are general chairs, we are like the, the, it's, the mukota, the, the mask, right? Uh, to to sort of, you know, to to this is how you perceive. Uh, we are the masks that you know cover the awesome hard work by so many of the chairs that uh, that uh, work behind the scenes. So the TPC chairs do much of the work in organizing the wonderful technical program. We are at day one of the core technical program, although we've had the tutorials and workshops earlier. So uh, uh, a big thank you uh, to uh, to Veena, Vinay, uh, and Marina, our technical program committee co-chairs. It's amazing that uh, uh, please give them a round of applause. Uh, and I also want to uh, acknowledge our uh, poster co-chairs. Oh, I have a list, the, the list right there. Thank you, Giovanni, Bharadwaj, and Rohit, who are uh, who are right here uh, as well. To to acknowledge, uh, I'd also like to thank all of our demo co-chairs, graduate forum, publication co-chairs, who've uh, uh, who worked with us uh, uh, and sort of established the wonderful graduate forum and publications that uh, uh, that for the backbone of the conference. Again, thank you to. I, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't go over all of them because we have so many uh, around the world. A big, a special co -thank, thank you to our panel co-chairs. We have three wonderful panels, uh, one today, one a little bit later, uh, uh, tomorrow, and then the day after we have three of them lined up. Tomorrow we have uh, uh, one of the, a fairly special one, which is commemorating the 15th year of Comsnets as well. So please join us for all of the wonderful panels that they've set up. Uh, I want to thank our web chair, Pagma, who, we always reach out to for something or the other. It's the, it's one of the hardest jobs to do in Comsnets. Our wonderful IT uh, platform co-chairs, uh, our workshop co-chairs, awards chairs, uh, our uh, tutorial co-chairs, um, and of course uh, award chairs. And uh, we uh, the back, we have had an amazing uh, port, you know steering committee as well as sponsorship uh, co-chairs. Uh, Giri and uh, Rajiv, who've been the backbone of the conference through the years. So, so this is Rajiv's 15th conference. He's been just introduced. He's been uh, spearheading it from the very beginning. So it's wonderful to have have them both here physically as well. Uh, and they also bring in the money. So that's the most important part, right? <laughs> uh, so special thanks also to our various workshop chairs. We've had women in engineering, net health, connected vehicles, mines, standards-driven research, uh, the uh, 
test bed workshop, a cybersecurity workshop. We've had some of these already uh, uh, yesterday, and we'll have some more happening later on uh, on Sunday. I also wanted to thank uh, uh, many of the chairs of the publicity social media chairs, our uh, uh, our uh, uh, registration co-chairs, our uh, comms jobs chair, our international advisory committee, and as, as I mentioned previously, the the steering committee. And I I apologize if I uh, if I missed anyone else uh, in this in this huge list of chairs that we've had. So uh, if if I could ask all of you to please give another round of applause to our wonderful organizing committee. So you can see that we have a very large committee, and it's for a reason. It's it is really hard to set up a conference that's that's hybrid, that's that uh, cuts across geographies. We've been very uh, we've had a very diverse set of chairs from around the world, from uh, cutting across different uh, different barriers. So we appreciate all of the hard work from all of the organi organizing committee. We are also thankful for our uh, tech sponsors, our technical sponsors, our uh, the ACM and the IEEE, uh, the SIG Mobile and SIG, uh, SIGCOM of the ACM who have, uh, who have worked with us, METI from the, gov the government of India, uh, as well as our various financial partners, you see their logos here, who've also supported us for over the years. So I, I don't want to single anyone out. I, I, I just uh, truly appreciate all of them. And Raji will talk about them later as well. Uh, thank you to all of our various partners for, for travel grants, video, uh, and so on. Our, our, enormous set of university partners uh, from around the world uh, as well. Uh, so let's go into the program. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are, uh, we've sort of passed the tutorials and we had a wonderful day of packed workshops uh, yester yesterday. And then uh, today we will uh, have, uh, 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 we will have our keynotes uh, followed by uh, two parallel tracks as well as the demos that also exist uh, uh, in parallel going going across uh, on multiple days. So there are technically three tracks if you think about it that way. Uh, and we uh, will continue to have that uh, tomorrow as well, including the, the banquet followed by uh, a final day. And we'll have panels cutting across the board uh, on all of the days. And we'll also have a final day of workshop. So that's sort of a bird's eye view of the program. You should have a booklet with which details uh, the program if you're interested in specific events. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge our wonderful speakers. We have invited speakers and panelists as well, but we also have wonderful keynote speakers from Ashu, Margaret, uh, Mati, and Saurabh. Uh, and uh, Margaret is right here uh, in person, and uh, so is uh, Saurabh as well. Uh, and uh, Ashu and Mati were, were slated to be in person too, but they, they ha couldn't make it, unfortunately, and they convey their regrets. Uh, but we will have virtual presentations from them. Uh, we also have a fireside chat from uh, from Bavish and Vita, who is our industry keynote speaker. So we, we are really thankful and we, we look forward to exciting uh, keynote addresses from all of them. So with that, uh, I thank you all uh, once again and over to, over to our MC. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you guys see you have a lot to look forward to and a lot to interact with. Uh, at this point, I would like to invite both the TPC chairs and the poster chairs to the stage. Uh, Veena uh, Mendirata from Northwestern University, USA. Vinay uh, Ribeiro, oh, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Ribeiro, uh, IIT Bombay, India. Uh, Marina Thornton from Amazon Web Services, USA. Uh, I believe uh, Giovanni will be from the University of Siena, Italy is online. I don't know if you are actually logged in, but uh, thank you for all your hard work, as is uh, Mr. Bharadwaj Sachidananda from uh, MIT USA, who is also, I believe, uh, joining us remotely, and Rohit Varma, of course, from uh, Intel Labs. Uh, if uh, the stage, uh, I'll hand it over to the, uh, yes, the TPC chair, Avinay, who will be taking you through their work today. Thanks. Uh, so I'm Vinay Ribeiro from IIT Bombay. I think I deserve a test of time award. I was there, I think, at the first uh, comsnet. <laughs> I stuck through all these. Yeah. Where are the slides? Okay. Uh, yes. So uh, we've had uh, a little bit of the statistics about papers. So we had 92 submissions this year. 
out of which 86 papers were sent for review. Every paper was reviewed by at least three uh, TPC members. And out of those, 34 were accepted papers. Uh, these will be spread out around uh, over 11 different sessions over three days. So besides these 34 regular papers, we also have seven invited papers. Uh, and uh, all, all these people will be giving invited talks uh, during the sessions. So, uh, as you see that uh, the papers have come not just from India, but from all over the world. We've had papers from the USA, Canada, UK, Germany, Sweden. These are all the, uh, from the accepted papers, Qatar, China even, and Australia, right? So this is truly an international conference uh, and we're getting papers from all over. Uh, here are some poster statistics. Uh, we had uh, 51 posters submitted, 38 accepted. Uh, In-person presentations will be 33, and a few of them will be presented virtually. And uh, poster co-chairs uh, given here. Rohit, I think, is here. Here are how the paper sessions are going to be spread out across the three days. Uh, today, we will have three different sessions. The first two will be uh, handled uh, parallelly at the same time. We've organized uh, the invited talks in such a way that they're not being held at the same time. So it's possible to attend more, or in fact, all the invited talks in all the sessions. Right? So today's uh, sessions will be network management, uh, security, cloud technologies. Uh, tomorrow, IoT, wireless architectures and protocols, cloud applications and learning. And uh, finally, on Saturday, sustainability and energy efficiency, physical layer wireless technologies, learning, and then privacy and blockchain. We have several invited speakers, uh, in fact, 10 of them, and they will be covering very diverse sets of topics from uh, ranging from wireless technologies to security uh, and uh, to artificial intelligence and learning and so on. Uh, some, uh, I'll just list out the speakers. Varsha Apte, who's in fact my head of department at IIT Bombay Computer Science. Professor Baek Young Choi from University of Missouri. Satish K from Nokia Lab, Bell Labs, India. Supratik Mukhopadhyay from Louisiana State University. Salil Kanhere from University of New South Wales, Australia. Gerald Karam from Nokia Bell Labs, USA. Devdut Mukherjee, who's the head of AI research at Misho India, Dinesh Rajan from Southern Methodist University, USA, Mridula Singh from CISPA, Germany, and uh, Surit Vadekar from Goodwin Proctor, USA. Uh, this is just a word cloud from the keywords of all the papers. And as expected, networks is the most popular word. This, is, this started out as a networking conference. But as you can see, there are other hot topics too uh, included, like learning and even blockchains. So Comsnet uh, is uh, you know, accepting papers in the latest cutting edge technologies, of course, related to systems and networks. Uh, we had 98 TPC members. This is, I'm just listing them out over here on the slides. And We'd like to acknowledge all of them for spending their valuable time reviewing the papers. Uh, besides the paper sessions, of course, there are workshops. There already there were workshops uh, yesterday and day before. There will be poster sessions, demos and exhibits, panel discussions, the graduate forum, and uh, tutorials too. So I hope uh, all of you have a wonderful time at ComsNet, and welcome again. Thank you. Anything else? A special round of applause to our TPC and poster chairs for such a diverse and yet curated program. It's not easy to do. Uh, in this room itself, you'll see the magic of partitioning and having those breakout sessions. And uh, I think it's a fantastic thing to have uh, joint sessions for some of the invited talks and speakers. Uh, okay, so next I would like to invite uh, the steering committee with the, uh, of course, everyone knows them who has been part of Comsnet, Rajiv Shore, 
uh, Giridhar Mantian from Qualcomm USA. Rajiv has multiple roles. I knew him first in IIC, then TCS, now uh, heading the UKDAR program with IIT Delhi and University of Queensland. Uh, I believe uh, Dr. Desai, uh, Uday Desai is here as well. And if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Uh, G. Venkatesh from Saskan, is he remotely joining us or is he here in person? Um, uh, Dr. Venkatesh is uh, remote, right? Okay. So uh, without further ado, I'll welcome the steering committee uh, to bring a little bit of uh, nostalgia and a little bit of way forward to this momentous ComsNet. Stage is yours. Thank you, Pooja. So hi, my name is uh, Gary Mundiam. I'm at uh, Qualcomm in the US. On behalf of the steering committee chairs, uh, his steering committee co-chair is myself, Dr. Rajiv Shori at IIT Delhi UKDAR, uh, and Professor Uday Desai at IIT Hyderabad, who are present and on stage, and uh, Dr. G. Venkatesh. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to uh, to the um, to the fifteenth version of Comsnets. Um, there's another gentleman on the stage, Professor Anurag Kumar. Who has also played a very important role in the uh, in the conference, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So, we do welcome you to the fifteenth version. So, Comsnets is the premier digital uh, digital communications conference in South Asia, and we also believe in the Asian continent. The first version of this uh, conference was a previous version called Comsware that was held in uh, January two thousand six. The present version titled ComsNets, was actually first held in January 2009. About 16 years ago, several of us got together who, to actually form this conference to be an independent entity. Now, note, when I say independent, we still maintain very tight, uh, tight um, collaboration with the major professional societies in this space, particularly IEEE and ACM, SIG Mobile, and SIGCOM. We also have a long-standing uh, relationship with the LRN Foundation, and through ACM Sigma, ACM SIGCOM, and LRN, we are actually able to uh, very generously fund the uh, the many uh, student travel grants that have uh, uh, that have uh, benefited all the participants, even to even for this kind of edition of the conference. So I mentioned that the conference is an independent conference. The, the conference is actually maintained by the Comsnets Association, a nonprofit association based in India. We actually have members from all over the world, uh, and there is over 60 members of the uh, association as of today. Professor Anurag Kumar, who is on the stage, please <laughs> give him a hand. He was the inaugural <laughs> of the, of the Indian Institute of Science, I should say. I forgot to mention his affiliation. He was the inaugural president the association and he was extremely instrumental in get, in uh, in getting this effort started and also has been extremely uh, ex extremely helpful over the years in making sure that the conference is, uh, is run to a high level of quality that uh, I know many of the attendees expect. So we've uh, the today these days uh, today uh, Professor Huzu Saran at IIT Delhi is now the president of the association. He should be here, uh, I guess he should be coming in later today. And uh, hopefully you'll also get to see him at the conference as well. I won't go through bullet by bullet what the, uh, what the uh, association's mission is, but um, there is a website. Please feel free to ta take a look at it. Um, we actually are not just, uh, we're not just uh, in, in the mission of just maintaining this conference the Comsnets Conference as a running entity year after year. We've also been active in uh, in in, um, in community outreach, researcher outreach, uh, funding of uh, funding of uh, fellowships, travel grants, etc. That are not affiliated with the conference necessarily. Um, also, international collaboration. Um, in fact, the first keynote, uh, Professor Martin Osi of the National Science Foundation, is uh, is an example. Of, uh, of the collaboration that we strive to maintain with the international organizations. Um, so it's um, it's a it, we also look at we're also looking forward to to expanding the the initiatives and outreach 
as we go forward in the years. Um, one example of this that has uh, actually come up during the past two years is the uh, AIML conference that is, uh, we just completed the second edition in October and uh, it was actually a highly uh, successful event. Some other association initiatives, the Compton Fellowship Awards, we're actually ple pleased to announce the winner of the January uh, Con Compton Fellowship Award, Ms. Daviani, they Gupta at, uh, sorry, Ms. Daviani Gupta at ISC. Um, we will be announcing the PhD dissertation fellowships uh, shortly. And as I mentioned, the AML conference, we're actually pleased to announce that uh, we will be holding a third edition. It will be announced shortly, and, it's, and it will be in the U.S. Um, we have a uh, tentative agreement to actually host it at the uh, Louisiana State University campus. And uh, Dr. Sipratik, uh, uh, Professor Sipratik Mukubadiai, who is uh, one of the invited speakers at the conference this year, has been very instrumental in, in getting that, uh, getting that moving forward. Conference overview, I think you've seen plenty of that, but I, I would strongly encourage you to, uh, to take advantage of the conference as you're here during this day and the next two days, and also if you're going to attend the next workshop session on Sunday. Um, the, workshops, uh, the workshops and tutorials were, uh, have been highly successful so far. The workshops were packed yesterday. We had a tutorial session the day before. Um, Six workshops in total, two, in, two, two new topic areas with this year that we introduced, test, test beds for advanced systems in research, TASER and CVAD, connected vehicles and, aut and autonomous driving, in addition to four workshops that were, uh, that were continued from the previous year. We also, uh, we also have uh, not just a strong technical program, but a strong poster program as well, and I do encourage you encourage all attendees to uh, to go ahead and explore those posters. Um, they'll be held during the next two days. Um, also, we have a run, we continue to have a highly successful demos and exhibits track. And this year it's on, it, we're, I guess we're pleased to say it's oversubscribed, although uh, the chairs, the demo and exhibit chairs have their work cut out for them. And uh, we do hope you can take a look at that. And then my understanding is we'll also get uh, Two electric motorcycles. Are they still on their way from Ola? <laughs> yes. So, uh, um, yes, we had the uh, comms job uh, session last night too before the inaugural. That actually brought uh, and brought several sponsoring companies together uh, with um, students and uh, and younger engineers uh, to allow uh, to allow for the establishment of recruiting channels. So I do hope you, uh, I, I do hope in addition to this and the, uh, and the fantastic keynotes and the panel sessions that uh, all attendees will take advantage of this opportunity during the next four days. Big thanks to our general chairs as you got to see them earlier today. Uh, uh, the steering committee would give a special thanks to Professor Manisha Ghost from Notre Dame University, Professor Soren Kumar from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and Professor Neil Ishmetha from the Indian Institute of Science. Their work was invaluable. They, they, and I, I would like to say that these, that all three of these, uh, all three have uh, highly demanding day jobs. So we do appreciate their efforts uh, from a steering committee perspective. We also appreciate the efforts of our technical program committee co-chairs who are also all in attendance and who also are up here er, er, earlier in the program. Dr. Vina Mandiretta, uh, formerly of Nokia Bell Labs, now Northwestern, Professor Vinay Ribeiro from, uh, uh, from IIT Bombay, and Dr. Maria Toto, who uh, formerly of Bell Labs, now with Amazon. Um, their work was invaluable in setting up a top-notch technical program and uh, in, in putting together a technical, a technical program committee. Very challenging as well. All three of these persons have day jobs, but they have to actually turn this around in a in a fairly short time frame within a matter of months. So uh, we do thank them for this. I'll now turn the floor over to Steering Committee Co-Chair Dr. Rajiv Shuri. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Giri. A very good morning to all. Uh, Rajiv Shuri, the Steering Committee Co-Chair. This is indeed a milestone edition of the conference. Uh, and I will, I promise I won't take more than two minutes before I request Professor Anurag Kumar, uh, who's been instrumental in, you know, in ensuring 
you know, we are today because uh, of the guidance uh, of the, you know, suggestions, uh, feedback, continuous feedback all these years around the clock from thought leaders all over the world. And one of them, uh, the key people behind this conference, Professor Anurag Kumar, of course, my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Uday Desai, uh, and I'll invite them in just a minute from now. But before we do that, I want to share a very uh, important information with you. Uh, that this is a milestone year. Yes, we all know that, but this year has broken all the records. We have a record participation, thanks to everyone in the committee. It's the highest registration in numbers. It's the highest sponsorship ever uh, in the history of consciousness. And thanks to every one of you, each and every uh, colleague in this committee, including many partners, friends, well-wishers have helped us to get sponsorship. We've chased startups from all over the world and they have come out and funded this conference. So thanks to all uh, once again for ensuring uh, to, you know, where we are today is because of collective efforts of many people across the globe. I also want to mention since uh, Professor Margaret is here all the way from Washington, this is also a shining example of Indo-US collaboration. Every year, the committee has a significant number of uh, top-notch minds from the United States. And, and I think we are so delighted that some of the best minds from U Europe, US, Asia Pacific come to Comstead. Uh, big thanks to, uh, special thanks to ACM and IEEE, but I would like to emphasize SIGCOM and SIGMOBIL have been very kind. We have $20,000 that we got from SIGCOM and SIGMOBIL. Greatly appreciate the efforts of the chairs of ACM, SIGCOM and SIGMOBIL. SIGMOBIL, we have 75 students who are here from all over the country and many from the United States. Uh, and thanks again to the efforts. We also would like to thank ACM India Council and TCS Research for being very generous in their grants to enable uh, a lot of uh, you know, students to travel to the conference. Uh, special thanks to all the sponsors. I'm not going to read the name, but they've been extremely generous. One of the things we saw this year uh, was that um, many startups uh, that earlier wasn't, it wasn't easy to get them to partner. Many startups have come on board for the first time, whether it's uh, Zentry Labs or, or Dozy or whether it's 21CC. Uh, and this is amazing. You know, these startups are all over and they are now partnering with Comnets. Uh, and that ecosystem we're seeing is changing very rapidly. So thanks to all. Uh, I would like to also mention that we have a special partnership with Arista, the Wi-Fi partners. Uh, we partner with River Publishers uh, and, of course, TSTSI, uh, which is uh, Mrs. Pamela Kumar is here. She's the Director General of uh, TSTSI, the, the telecom standards body in the country, but the premier body in the country. Uh, she's been very former general chair of Comsnet. They've been instrumental in getting a uh, close partnership with Department of Telecommunications. Uh, again, we have so many uh, you know, university partners. I'm going to go, go through all of them. A conference is made of people who really toil, sweat and toil uh, around the clock, right, uh, for 12 months to make it happen. And some very special, uh, you know, like to mention the contribution of the people, in addition, of course, the general chairs, TPT chairs, and all the chairs in the committee. Uh, I think uh, a special mention of Pragya Pragmaka, the web chair, unbelievable. We would send her an email, anybody in the committee, and you get a response in minutes. And she's doing a PhD. So I told her you're doing two PhDs, right? One is Comstead's web chair, other is your, like, your own PhD. Raj Sharma has been instrumental in local elements. He's not here, he's in IT Bombay, but uh, been amazingly uh, you know, behind the conference all these years. Chandrika Sridhar is outside. Uh, you know, she's worked closely uh, with Professor Kumar in his office many years. And I think the training has come from Professor Kumar. She's a pillar of this conference in registration and finance. Everything here is, uh, you know, it's a not-for-profit and every penny coming in is accountable. And I think Mr. Chandrika does a great stellar job of that. So kudos to the entire team over here. Late Himanshu Gandhi, of course, uh, thanks to general chairs uh, that they mentioned him. Said Hiraj Amuru, the, the Dheriata, who's in the U.S., could make it. Kostub, our uh, demo chairs, our poster chairs. Uh, Rohit is here. Manav and Saurabh Bansal are very special volunteers. I'm delighted that my students in IIT Delhi uh, also winding up their uh, dual degree from IIT Delhi have done a great job as IT and virtual platform co-chairs and as volunteers. And of course, thanks to all the volunteers. So thank you once again for being here in this very special year. I'm now going to request uh, Professor Anurag Kumar and Professor Uday Desai to please come and share your thoughts uh, and we'll kickstart the conference after that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think a lot has been said, so I won't keep uh, repeating it. Uh, just two things I'd like to mention. One is that, uh, you know, sustaining something is always much harder than starting something. It was a lot easier for us to start 
but today is a proud moment at least to me and all of my colleagues in the who founded comsnet association and sustained this conference for 15 years another group of people is not just the tpc chairs and the general co chairs and uh, the organizing committee uh, chairs uh, for this 15th edition but all the 15 editions i think the Com comsnets has been successful because of this large number of people i think if we put all of them together it may turn out to be maybe 150 or 200 people in terms of over the 15 years the organizing committees that we have had the general chairs co chairs all of them maybe we'll create a wall on our web page acknowledging all of them who have contributed over the last 15 years having said that uh, just one more comment and last night i was discussing with professor bakchi uh, i think we have done well as rajiv said we have broken kind of all records etc etc for this year but i think the question now is what next you know of course we can keep continuing we had whatever i don't remember the registration numbers i'm putting some number maybe 225 paid registrants maybe next year we may manage 250 or 300 we can do that but in terms of is there a fundamental change or a step change that we can bring in the conference we are all brainstorming over it and since all of you are here if you have any ideas any thoughts please do let us know and let's see what we can do so once again thank you to all of you for coming and this is for the after i think covid this is the first real in person conference of course it's partly hybrid but most of you are here we are hoping that next year everybody will be here all the speakers from all over the world thank you so much well it's a tradition that everybody must have a say so i'll say a few words uh, <clears throat> just a couple of words i remember when we started comsnets uh, 15 years back 2009 i think it was 2009 um, we were aspiring to match infocom i think as uh, uh, udaya just said we probably haven't gotten there but we have gotten pretty far i think today in the corridors of academia at least i hear people say oh i had my paper accepted in comsnets i'm going to comsnets i think there's a somewhat of a change uh, from the time the comsnet was just uh, a newbie and finally i just want to say that all the rajiv and uh, girdha have thanked everybody nobody has thanked them i think we wouldn't have been solvent and had this conference but for the you know gagant one effort that they have put in to raise money from every quarter i think the list of running uh, sources is quite amazing so yeah thank you so much uh, round of applause for the steering committee who steers this conference in the right direction um we actually have a very special uh, presentation uh, coming up i'd like to uh, invite uh, dr uh, nilesh mehta from the general chair to introduce our surprise guest yeah uh, so it's my pleasure and i'll keep this short uh, it's my pleasure to invite the secretary of dot um, uh, mr k rajaraman it's a pre recorded video it's short it's just 10 minutes um, and i think he'll be spelling out some of the initiatives that uh, the government of india has taken in the area of telecommunications so that's it uh, please watch the video first of all i would like to um, congratulate the the organizers of uh, of comsnet comsnet for consistently organizing this uh, research uh, conference uh, from uh, uh, bangalore you know, for several years so india is a uh, uh, is on the cusp of uh, a, tra a transition from 4g to 5g with uh, the launch of 5g uh, being done by the prime minister sometime uh, in october this last year so as we do this uh, we are deeply conscious of the uh, national priorities so uh, let me dwell a few minutes on the uh, priorities of of india as far as uh, the telecom and connectivity is concerned i think first of all i think india is a very diverse country where uh, there is a huge uh, uh, variety and diversity in the geography the customer uh, po the population density and the uh, requirements of uh, of of uh, users of uh, telecom services so uh, it 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 requires a great deal of uh, of thought while uh, while rolling out telecom systems in this country which requires 
uh, different technologies to be used in different kind of contexts and environments. Uh, it is also important to note that uh, that India's uh, requirement as one of the developed countries is to provide affordable and ubiquitous connectivity. So affordability of the of the of the of the networks uh, would, uh, would come based on the affordability of the technology itself. So uh, from that perspective, uh, any technology that is developed needs to be cost effective and also efficient from the point of view of uh, telecom operations, telecom. Uh, 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 service providers. So, uh, given all these factors, it is very important that uh, uh, while technology is developed, uh, we look at uh, designing systems which are uh, uh, efficient from a cost point of view and also uh, enables uh, a lo much lower capex intensity compared to any other form of technology. So, therefore, the work uh, that our researchers do in all these matters is very crucial. While this being said, we, we, if you look at the global scenario, uh, today we are in a situation when uh, climate change is posing a great threat, threat to the planet itself. So therefore, I mean, all sectors are now uh, under great pressure to actually to ensure that uh, they, uh, they, the carbon emissions are under control. So uh, the concept of green telecom and uh, the need to actually uh, Further drive down the uh, energy int intensity of uh, of uh, equipment is also another great priority. The uh, another global development relates to the issue of security. And I think it's very important that uh, that all networks remain safe and secure and provide reliable services to consumers, be the government uh, uh, customer or a private customer. So uh, in, the, in the recent past, we have seen that there have been an increasing uh, uh, intensity of cyber attacks, given the fact that more and more people are uh, getting into uh, the telecom network, I mean, either through uh, mobile connectivity or through fixed wireline connectivity. So, therefore, uh, the importance of cyber security has also forced a rethink how we design systems. The, uh, the need for uh, designing systems uh, within the country and enabling India designed. Uh, um, Software for telecom as well as hardware is something which uh, has also been driving policies within the country. So, from all these perspectives, I think there is a there's a great opportunity here within India for building systems within the country and also uh, manufacturing them uh, for the Indian market as well as the global markets. I'm very happy that uh, Comsnet uh, uh, is organizing this conference in this uh, larger context of uh, of an Atmanirbhar Bharat where. Uh, the focus is on uh, enabling cost-effective technology uh, of Indian design to be uh, to be uh, manufactured within the country. The uh, the government of India, in order to enable development of technology within the country, has, has uh, launched a number of efforts, which I would like to bring to your notice. The first being the 5G test bed, which was launched in 2018. Uh, at a cost of nearly 224 crores. I mean, after about four years of uh, a lot of uh, solid efforts by the IIT Madras, IIT Hyderabad, Kanpur, Karakpur, and uh, uh, IIT Mumbai, Samir, uh, IIT Delhi, and other things, we are uh, we have a, a, a 5G core and a 5G um, radio access network uh, of various uh, bands which are available for further um, commercialization by various organizations. So I'm very happy to note that uh, while uh, the, the 5G test bed has delivered on its uh, on its promise, there are a number of other players also who have done extremely good work in, in developing 5G technologies within the country, one being CDOT, which has uh, invested heavily in, uh, in uh, writing the, uh, the code for the 4G core. And I think in fact, the 4G core has been already been tested uh, to commercial standards. And is and available for for rollout across the country. The uh, CDOT also launched its uh, 5G NSA core sometime in uh, in October as part of the Indian Mobile Congress. Uh, it is also working on a 5G SA core to be uh, released sometime during the middle of uh, the of, of this year, 2023. So uh, these are some of the efforts which the uh, public funded institutions have been undertaking. I'm also happy to see that a number of private institutions, especially the uh, industries. Uh, like Geo uh, uh, have been taking a number of steps to to actually build an India stack. Uh, we all 
also have PCS and Tejas, also which uh, have uh, pioneered and piloted uh, a 4G and a 5G um, uh, stack. Um, while the large companies uh, are also, I mean, are on the job, uh, we, um, I'm happy to also to note and to bring to the attention of the house that a number of startups like Leka, Sukta, Sankhya, um, and uh, Signal Chip, and many others have actually ventured into this very difficult field in building uh, not only the radio the radios, but also they have also built. Uh, I mean, I'm, uh, Signal Chip has actually built a chip uh, for the 5G. I think which is something which is very commendable. So. Uh, to, in order to support these efforts, the Department of Telecommunication has launched a number of schemes which, uh, which enable all these uh, kinds of uh, players to actually to expand on their R&D efforts. The uh, DCIS scheme which we have launched uh, last year has supported a number of uh, startups um, in, to, to actually design products. I mean, they provide small grants for the uh, I mean, which, which are for uh, products and solutions which are at TRL level 1, 2, etc. While uh, we have recently launched a, a, an effort to provide a larger funding to um, enterprises which are uh, which are in the process of uh, uh, entering the market on a commercial scale, so the Technology Development Fund uh, has been launched uh, uh, with a five percent contribution from the USOF. Runs to about nearly about 500 crores per year, and uh, happy to know that we, we have received an exceedingly large number of applications uh, which are now under process. And we expect that this uh, fund will also boost the, uh, the, the the scale and the scope and the depth of telecom research within this country. And uh, I'm I'm happy. Um, uh, we'll be happy to facilitate the uh, the researchers who are who are already here in, in the constant conference, who are presenting papers, and also who are probably taking forward these uh, these ideas into products and solutions to to step out and then and be part of this uh, development journey of designing and build a prototyping. And commercializing uh, their uh, their ideas. So uh, uh, we are um, while we do all this, I think we I mean, let me also before I go into the uh, the conference conference, uh, I would also like to mention a couple of other uh, initiatives which we have done. I think one is that uh, we have uh, we are working on a uh, we have set up a task force for advanced optical communication, another task force for quantum communication. And uh, and one more um, um, task force has been working on the 6G um, uh, scoping and a visioning exercise. So all these uh, task forces have uh, have actually uh, a number of uh, inputs, I think, which which are uh, which, which will be taken to the next level. Um, the um, we also uh, are probably very close to uh, a government decision on on investing in the quantum uh, computing and commu communications uh, related research. So the Department of Science and Technology is likely to to take a decision on this, and this will further spur the the investment in uh, and uh, development of quantum communications and quantum computing related technologies. Department of Telecom uh, is uh, is working with startups uh, intensively, and uh, it is just not about uh, providing facilitation, but also we we are very keen to support any pilots by uh, the telecom startups in in piloting their solutions in live telecom networks. In fact, uh, in the last uh, one year, I think we have supported about four pilots of uh, uh, some of these companies to support uh, testing of, uh, of uh, uh, 4G radios by three uh, startups and uh, an E-band radio by another startup. So all these uh, exercises, I'm sure, will lead to uh, commercial grade systems, which can be then procured by, by the public as well as the private telecom service providers. Let me... Um, um, also, well on the the conference that uh, uh, the constant conference. So the the discussion, the quality of the discussion which I have just seen in your portal is something which is creditable. I only hope that uh, the uh, the follow up uh, of the of these papers which are published into kind of um, uh, POCs and prototypes, etc., is something which uh, which I would encourage all the researchers to venture into. The Department of Telecom, as well as the uh, the Technology Development Board of the Government of India, the DRDO, DST, the IDEX uh, scheme of the, the Ministry of Finance, Defense, all of them offer a variety of grants which enable you to kind of convert your ideas into into products and solutions. So I would uh, encourage all, uh, the, some of the researchers here who have uh, who have the bandwidth to actually to to step forward and and, and come uh, ahead with this exercise. Uh, let me also say.
that the telecom standard development society of india which was uh, which uh, uh, which was set up since uh, 2018 played a significant role in bringing towards together all the researchers in building and participating in the international standards making the uh, the efforts that we uh, uh, some of the research uh, community have done in uh, jointly with tsdsi in enabling the integration of the 5gi standards or the lmlc standards in, in the mobile phone uh, uh, mobile phones for enabling better coverage and uh, enabling uh, uh, lower capex intensity for uh, in, in 5g is something which is uh, for the credit of tsdsi and the research community so we would want more such patents to actually to be part of global standards so i would encourage the researchers here to work intensively with the with tsdsi in 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 taking your your patents and your standards into uh, in the upcoming uh, releases of various standards of various telecom products be it uh, 3gpp for mobile communication or ieee for wifi and a variety of other uh, technologies or maybe it could be iet or any other kind of standards making body so we'll be very happy to support you and facilitate you uh in fact uh, we have we have we are uh, providing grants to psdsi to to support researchers to to participate in the in the meetings of the international standards body bodies to uh, to enable them to incorporate some of these uh, leading developments uh, and intellectual properties into the upcoming releases of various standards so we will be very happy to also support uh, um, the uh, researchers also in this exercise Uh, let me uh, uh, also add that uh, uh, the it's very important that that the IPR regime within this country also gets further improved and tuned. So for that, I think we have prepared a an IPR standards paper, a strategy paper, which uh, uh, we will be very happy to upgrade and update based on the inputs received from you. I mean, uh, we will be uh, the the standards uh, innovations uh, division of the of the Department of Telecom. We actively engage with all of you in in, in getting uh, some of these policy uh, issues upgraded, so that maybe the, the Indian um, researchers uh, find it uh, uh, easy to actually to to, to take their uh, um, uh, intellectual properties uh, into a product and a solution at the earliest possible, and also to ensure that uh, the research uh, is a commercially viable and a productive activity. I would I would end by saying that. Uh, that the opportunities that that india is unleashed thanks to the uh, atmanirbhar bharat uh, strategy that the honorable prime minister has laid out since 2020 is uh, is a great uh, um, uh, is something which all of you must really uh, tap and uh, use to actually to build a strong research and development uh, foundation for the telecom sector in this country the department of telecom will uh, will be very great, uh, will be very happy to support you we have in public institutions like c dot which have built a, a number of consortia for various uh, verticals I mean, including 5g for quantum communication for uh, cyber security for, for machine and iot related uh, services and so on and so forth so we will uh, c dot will be very happy to facilitate you in this process and uh, and uh, uh, encourage you to to uh, to be part of their uh, product development and uh, and design uh, teams i uh, wish constant all success and look forward to the to, to the uh, to the amazing range of uh, um, technical presentations and uh, hope to take some uh, very good cues from from the presentations that are made to uh, to enable a lot of uh, research to happen within this country and uh, we also look forward to facilitating the research that would come out of some of these uh, papers that you are going to put. uh thank you and uh, jai hind um thank you everyone uh and i think this shows comsnet's not just the international collaborative appeal but the alignment with policy makers and government as well uh while we may have to push the tea break a little bit uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite uh, dr monisha ghosh to uh introduce our first uh, eminent keynote speaker and i'm glad uh, so many of you had the time to be here today to hear her speak
thank you, Pooja. Uh, it's, uh, we are running a bit late, so I'll keep the introduction uh, very short. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure to uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Margaret Martinozzi of the National Science Foundation. Uh, she is the Assistant Director of uh, Computer and Information Sciences uh, and Engineering, that's called SICE, uh, with a budget of uh, an annual budget of a billion dollars uh, in R&D spending. Uh, she is also a professor, uh, the Hugh Trimble Professor of Computer Science uh, at Princeton University. She's been an Associate Dean at Princeton prior to that. Uh, and she also conducts her own research. Uh, her interests are in computer architecture and hardware software interface issues in both classical and quantum computing systems. Uh, Dr. Martinosi is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the ACM and a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, so without any further ado, I will hand it over to Margaret. Welcome. Great, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, it's wonderful to be here today um, and to hear the, the introductions that, that led up to this. Uh, so as was mentioned, I wear two hats. I'm both a university professor and I'm on leave from my university to come into the National Science Foundation um, to steer the funding for computer and information science and engineering research uh, for the US and also collaborations that reach out to other countries, including yours. Um, actually, the NSF operates with about 20% of its workforce being these rotators who come in from the research community, including Dr. Ghosh, who's also served there fairly recently. Uh, so it's wonderful to get the chance to talk. What I'm gonna talk about today is both a bit about our approach to the field overall, and then by the end, some notions about shared resources and opportunities for collaboration, and then hopefully also some opportunities for a bit of Q&A and discussion at the end. So with that, uh, here we go. Uh, so what is the National Science Foundation? This is the United States' all of science, basic science research agency. It was founded in the aftermath of World War II uh, to basically take a nation and say, what should we ne do next and how can we make science benefit society? And so the mission statement, this is the building, uh, the mission statement is to promote the progress of science and to advance the national health, prosperity, and welfare. So it has this notion of impact built into uh, what we seek to do every day. Um, and what I'm gonna talk about today is how we do that in the computing part of the world most, uh, most notably. So I always start my talks actually with this slide, and this might surprise you. Uh, this is a picture of a tree. It's in my backyard in my primary home on the east coast of the US. My husband and I love this tree, and we have no idea who planted it. And um, actually, a lot of different cultures have the notion of one generation plants the tree so that the next generation can benefit from it, from the shade, from the beauty, and so forth. And I see research that way too, right? So when you start working on an idea, when you start advising a student, when you write your, the sort of first draft of your paper, those are all acts of planting a tree in the hopes that maybe uh, in five years or 10 years, more people are using it. It's a technical standard. It's gotten uptake. Other people have built off of it. Those trees have gotten planted and, so, and, and cultivated. And so what NSF seeks to do is basically help people plant a broad and diverse set of trees to get a broad and diverse set of benefits over time. So I always start with this. And then what do I switch to? I switch to my, what I call my tree stories. So how have we had that impact over the years? Um, we've had that impact in different ways. Uh, so one kind of impact is, is foundational impact, really digging in in fundamentals for computing and for discovery. And uh, that picture, that's a picture of uh, a black hole imaged. And you might say, well, that looks like astronomy to me. Uh, but we're, we're computer folks, so we know that there's actually a lot of computing in that picture too. And in fact, um, one of the young researchers whose algorithm helped to image that black hole at very high resolution using Bayesian inference uh, received her early career award from our directorate just two years ago. So it's wonderful to see this. Um, looking sort of further up in the career pipeline, about two thirds of the Turing Award winners, our Nobel Prize in Computing, um, have received NSF funding at some point in their careers. Uh, the second kind of impact is about translational impact, so transition to practice. I don't expect you to be able to read this diagram in this size, uh, 
But the idea of this diagram is elaborated on in a URL that is cut off the bottom of this slide, but uh, hopefully I can get that for you. It's a National Academies study that was done. It's actually done about every four years to translate from research over time to long-term impacts. And so it's come to be called the tire tracks diagram because of how this looks like uh, skid marks, tire tracks. Uh, those are actually timelines of different computing topic areas and seminal results that have sort of pivoted back and forth between academic research, industry research, and products and services across the topic areas. The middle of this diagram, just to give you a sort of conceptual feel for what it talks about, the middle of this diagram are the companies in the IT sector that say, yes, these discoveries helped us. And so those are the Apples, the Qualcomms, and so forth that really stepped up and told the National Academies the ways that those seminal impacts had been translated to their work. But the interesting part of the most recent 2020 update of the diagram are the, is the rightmost part, which are uh, what we call the IT transformed sectors. So those are not the companies that look like IT companies. Those are the other companies that use IT without really looking like IT. So that's the agriculture sector, the health sector, the entertainment sector, deeply benefiting from the innovations of our field without actually sort of looking like IT. And by the time you get out to this right-hand side, it's about a trillion dollars of economic impact that we're talking about stemming out of our discoveries. And then the, the last aspect of the impact out of our investments is societal impact, how we are benefiting communities, American communities and communities worldwide by changing the face of computing, um, by welcoming all, creating opportunities for all. So that's kind of high level. Uh, we can dig in and give some examples. Uh, how many of you have used Duolingo? Wonderful, hands up. I'm told that there's a Hindi version that I should be using right now. Um, <laughs> Uh, so Duolingo has an NSF story to it. Uh, Luis Van On, the, the CEO and co-founder of Duolingo, uh, was supported by our directorate, uh, by NSF, from grad school through early career faculty life, as were several of his graduate students who then went on to become CTO and senior director of engineering at Duolingo. The timeline here is that the size funding, the funding from my directorate, um, actually helped him do advances in computational models for social network organization for human computational systems, some of which ended up being able to generate data uh, on how education could actually be, be a tool to generate data sets in order to create new machine learning algorithms for language translation, for voice recognition, and so forth. And it was from that genesis of these data sets and these kinds of human computational systems that the idea of Duolingo uh, sort of uh, caught flight and has now become a greater than $3 billion uh, free and accessible tool that so many people around the world have benefited from. So that's a wonderful story. Uh, here's another story, software-defined networks, maybe a little bit closer to the ComsNet's crowd more directly. Uh, if you look at the, the global internet traffic today versus 15 years ago when ComsNet started, there's profound differences, right? Orders of magnitude growth in the amount of traffic that the global internet needs to carry. And yet, there wasn't a day where we all sort of stopped and waited for the global internet to get upgraded, right? Under the covers, there have been sequences of innovations that helped the internet scale and maintain controllability, configurability, security, and resiliency through that scaling. Uh, and one of the things that, that uh, sort of brought, helped bring that about was the notion of software-defined networks. So NSF investments uh, have actually been key to creating the field of software-defined networks over the past 15 to 20 years. We've invested around $185 million, believe it or not, in different SDN research topic areas over those, over those two decades. Uh, in 2008, uh, there was a key a $10 million award called an Expeditions in Computing Award that's sort of considered a pivotal point in getting this notion of software-defined networks to launch. And that's the idea of software-defined networks being this idea of sort of programmable open networks where the control plane and the data plane are, are separately managed. Uh, so $185 million, that's not cheap. What did we uh, buy? How many trees did we get planted with that one? Uh, this is... This is 
a, a sort of rough estimate of the market capitalization of SDNs at this point. To be honest, I don't think that the market capitalization is really the, the value or the impact story to, to dwell on. It's more that SDNs have just been a, a fundamental aspect of keeping the internet scalable and resilient as it grows. And so that's a sort of point of pride for us as well. Uh, one more example, reinforcement learning. Uh, this is a very brief timeline. Uh, what we're proud of here are some sort of points where we are pretty sure that we were the only heat on during the AI winter, uh, if you will, right? So artificial intelligence has its roots decades ago. The Dartmouth workshop in 1956 is sort of one of the roots of AI. Alan Turing was asking, can machines think in 1950? So it's a very old topic area. And as you know, it's had its sort of ups and downs, the so-called AI winters over the years. Um, but one person said to me, Margaret, have you ever looked at this book, this uh, Sutton and Bartow book? And to be honest, I hadn't. I went back and looked at it, though. It's very interesting. So it, it really it was written in 1998. Many of you probably weren't even born in 1998. Uh, <laughs> And then you look at it and it didn't get cited, it didn't get cited, nobody read it for like 15 years. And then all of a sudden we've got this hockey stick of real growth that, uh, yeah, so almost no citations. And then, sorry for my picture blocking, ah! So, and then all of a sudden the, the hockey stick of growth, 7,000 citations in 2021 alone. So is this book sort of solely responsible for reinforcement learning? No. But it's part of an ecosystem of NSF investments. Both of the authors were like heavily funded, 21 NSF awards to the lead author. The, the second author is uh, the student of the lead author on this, on this book. Both heavily funded by NSF over the years. And what you can see is that it was the NSF funding that sort of stabilized AI, machine learning, and reinforcement learning research funding over the years. Um, in, the, in the time period where not much was going on, it wasn't as clear what was going to happen in the field. So that's another example where uh, maybe this is the equivalent of the drought and the tree needs a little bit of water even while it's during a drought so that it doesn't die. Um, so with that, those are four different impact stories. There are a ton more. One of the great uh, sort of joys of leading uh, an organization like SIZE is the chance to kind of see those impact stories play out and to see how you as researchers are, are sort of feeding into those impact stories. Um, here's what size looks like as an organization. Uh, in particular, we're divided into four units, three of which cover the research space of our field, the, the blues and the teals here. The fourth is unique. It is organizationally within size, um, but it has the mandate to serve the full science and engineering community with advanced cyber infrastructure. So that's from astronomy to, to zoology and everything in between. I also put this slide up here to just to note that, uh, you know, size is about people. Um, we tend to be a very approachable agency as a whole. And so I, I hope that uh, you and your collaborators will feel very welcome to reach out when you have ideas, when you have thoughts. So we have that org chart, but we're happy to color across the lines when there are things that need to be done that don't, that don't sort of fit siloed within one division. And so there's a whole range of size-wide initiatives uh, that we uh, take on, including that expeditions in computing program that's just led to tremendous sort of breakthroughs, software-defined networks, the Berkeley data analytics stack, and other uh, sort of innovations that have come out of the expeditions program. Um, there are also uh, multi-directorate initiatives that size leads, and I'll talk about some of those as we go forward as well. So by the numbers, this is what uh, computing looks like at NSF. Uh, size has roughly uh, a $1 billion a year budget. Uh, we use that to steward that for the community to invest in research all over America. Uh, we have a process, a merit review process that takes in proposals and reviews them. And so in a typical year, we take in between six and 8,000 proposals and we take them through a rigorous merit review process. We're able to fund about a quarter of them or around 1,700 to 2,000 uh, awards get made every year. 
where do they go? Uh, first order answer to that is they go basically everywhere in America. Uh, NSF is the primary funder for basic science across every science and engineering topic area, but nowhere is that more true than computing, where we fund 80% of the federal funding that goes out to computing in America. So essentially everything academic that's happening in our field uh, has a bit of NSF in it, and we're really proud of that. In terms of the institutions supported, uh, size supports 376 institutions. This is FY22 numbers, FY22 ended fairly recently. So what does that mean? If you've heard of Carnegie R1 institutions, those are the most research intensive institutions in the US. There are about 150 of those. Uh, many of you might be affiliated with them or collaborating with them, right? So there's 150 of those and we essentially send funding out to all 150 of those. But that means there's another 220 institutions beyond that. Those are community colleges, predominantly undergrad institutions and nonprofits that we fund as well. We fund across the whole country and we fund at the level of sort of 20,000 people a year, including close to 7,000 graduate students a year. So what do we fund? Uh, when we think about the future of computing, uh, we organize it in terms of these three overarching and cross-cutting technical themes. And these are deliberately not sort of siloed into one of those divisions that I showed you before. These are deliberately intended to be broad organizational umbrellas that essentially everyone in the field, everyone in this room should find themselves underneath one, but probably underneath two or three of these actually. Uh, so I'll talk about each one of them in a little more detail. In particular, the first one, size in a post-war world or the seismic shift, and yes, there is a little pun there, um, is about how do we navigate the end of Moore's law? Uh, the end of Moore's law is actually not just sort of a semiconductor thing that's happening under the covers. It's a true seismic shift that's affecting the whole stack and we need to think about how we invest in research accordingly. The second one is about AI. And again, AI is not sort of a subfield off on the side and it's not just machine learning. AI is really drawing from an all of size, all of computing inflection point. It's algorithms, but it's also data and systems that have brought AI to where it is. And likewise, AI is influencing all of our field and all of many other fields as well. And so that's what we sort of focus on here. The last one is about designing beneficial socio-technical systems. And our field has been socio-technical from the start. Uh, you know, there's deep human impacts and human influences on what we all do. Um, connectivity is a great example of a hugely socio-technical topic area. Uh, but I don't think we've always acknowledged the degree to which those human influences and human impacts play a role in what we do. And so this third theme is about sort of stepping back to think about that. Uh, so I can talk in more detail about each one of these. And in particular, I'll give some examples of programs that we've set up. Uh, not, you know, for the sense of like uh, who should go out and propose to them right away, but in the sense of like, here's how we're thinking about these things, here's how we're approaching these things. So for that first theme about computing in a post-Moore's Law world, uh, you know, the end of Moore's Law is something that's been sort of widely anticipated, widely discussed. And whether we're at the end or simply in a slowdown, uh, what's clear is that we are at a point where we fundamentally need to rethink everything about what we design in computer systems. And so this picture is, <laughs> might be puzzling to you. This picture is a picture of the water pocket fold region in Western US in the state of Utah. So why do I use that picture? I use that picture because it is a place where there were horizontal sedimentary layers that were all neat and tidy and stacked on top of each other. And then a seismic shift occurred and the whole thing turned kind of sideways. This is what's happening to our field right now. You know, in the 1990s, we did a big technology shift from bipolar transistors to CMOS transistors. And many people within our own field didn't even know it was happening because it was hidden under abstraction layers and the software folks didn't need to worry about it. But this shift is different. The phones that we're designing, the phones that we're using, the laptops, everything in that software stack is changing this time. And it's both a challenge that we need to rethink these layers and an opportunity that we get to rethink these layers. Uh, we're already seeing dramatic differences in how we program systems, how we verify them for security and reliability. Uh, so this 
principles and practice of scalable systems is one example of an NSF program to address this change. It asks people to come in with proposers at different layers. So it's a hardware person and a, maybe a compilers person and a software person and a domain expert who come in to say, we're gonna come up with a new programming stack for genomics or for formal verification or for something. They come in as a team, they propose as a team uh, to say, we're gonna handle the seismic shift for this whole topic area. And it's been just fascinating to watch the kinds of domain specific approaches that have been uh, proposed and funded through this. Um, and so we keep up with annual deadlines on this period uh, every year. Obviously, semiconductors and microelectronics is a big topic in the world today. And in the US today, we just passed sweeping legislation in the US called the Chips and Science Act. Uh, there was a brief uh, joke about whether it could be the Chips and Salsa Act, but didn't quite manage that. So on the chips side of the Chips and Science Act, there are sort of major investments in thinking about the future of semiconductors and their fabrication. Um, and so I wanted to show, this is a sort of a, an overview of all the directorates at NSF and offices that play a role in programmatics. And then the five that are highlighted in uh, gold are the five that are most closely involved with the CHIPS Act legislation. So it is not just a one directorate thing. Uh, but rather, you know, material science lives in the math and physical sciences. Engineering plays a strong role in communications and infrastructure. Size, we have that whole stack that's built on these semiconductors. STEM education and technology innovation and partnerships. So this is really a five uh, directorate, all hands on deck response to semiconductors. One of the programs that these five directorates are working on together it's called FUSE, the future of semiconductors. And it really embraces that notion of we got to all work together. So imagine if you wanted to collaborate with a material scientist to say, I want to do something that's related to uh, computer and communication systems that are based on, I don't know, maybe DNA storage or something that goes well beyond uh, current semiconductors. That's the kind of thing that FUSE is intending to uh, support. We had our first deadline about six months ago. Uh, for a set of what are called teaming grants. Uh, so form a team, start working on something. Uh, we don't have the next deadline announced yet, but you can do the math. If we're doing teaming grants, we must be teaming towards something. I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, next is about chip fabrication access. This is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I firmly believe that an awful lot of our ideas in our fields need better support to prototype them for real, right? So we often do work where we're simulating, we're analyzing, we're estimating, but often by the end of it, we'd really love it if we could fabricate something in silicon. And NSF has not traditionally been super helpful, <laughs> frankly, to our NSF funded researchers in helping make that happen. Uh, so this Dear Colleague Letter or DCL is something that we issued in August. And again, it's a, it's a multi-directorate effort to say, if you've been working on an NSF funded research project for a couple years, and you think you're ready to fab something, then we can offer you supplemental funding to help you and your, and your students learn about the fab process and then go and do it. And so I'm really proud of this as a way to enhance pathways for experiential learning, broaden the opportunities of who actually gets to fab a chip um, as part of our research space. So that's the first theme. The second theme is about the transcendence of AI. And as I said, this is very broadly viewed. Um, AI uh, goes way back. It goes back to the Turing test in the 1950s, expert systems in the 1980s. And it really was fueled by this uh, convergence of AI algorithms, data, and systems. Uh, so it's not just an algorithmic thing. Um, if we sort of look at what's next, uh, what's next for AI? It's going to involve new programming models and interfaces. It's going to involve new systems. Uh, how, how do we develop systems for training, for inference, for data collection around an AI uh, world? And then, you know, there's a huge opportunity in all of these shifts because your community is going to play a strong role in how we navigate this transition, how we sort of bring AI out to many application areas and how we bring AI to bear on our own communications and comp computation systems. 
So how do we invest for this broad view? Um, I made a version of this diagram a couple years ago. I think it was literally on a napkin or a piece of paper. And uh, what is really rewarding now is to see how much of this diagram exists. Went from aspiration to reality. Uh, and I don't know how well you can read the, the white font here. I apologize. Uh, so a key aspect of our investments in AI in America are a set of national AI research institutes that we have stood up over the past two years. Each one is a $20 million investment, and there are 18 of them in the U.S. now. And each one of them has a lead university and a set of 10 or 20 additional collaborating universities. Uh, so you can think about each one of them as their own sort of ecosystem or, or a set of planets there with their moons, right? Uh, so all the red in this are the AI institutes. We wanted a way to link them together. Uh, the, the light blue here is a virtual organization that gets all the AI institutes to talk. And it just had its first in-person meeting a month ago, all the AI institute leaders in the same room talking. Uh, we wanted on-ramps from other universities to be able to better partner and collaborate in with these AI institutes. And we knew we wanted international AI partnerships as well. So that's what the, the purple up here is. Uh, so where are we now from sort of drawing this on a piece of paper? Where we are now is a huge ecosystem built around these AI institutes. The international supplements happened over the past year, thanks to um, help from our colleagues in the NSF's Office of International Science and Engineering. We stood up opportunities where these different countries, including India, are each linked to one or more of the AI institutes for collaborations. We funded the US side, the international collaborators identify funding on their side. Uh, there's also a rich sort of set of private sector partnerships, agency partnerships across the US federal government, uh, the virtual organization exists, and the linkages out to minority serving institutions, that on-ramp concept that I mentioned, just got stood up in the past month. So basically that diagram from the previous slide is now a full functioning ecosystem and we're really excited to see where it goes next. Uh, moving forward, one of the things that we know is that AI is not sort of on its own in isolation and AI is not the only tool in the computational toolkit. We have other tools in our Swiss Army knife, right? So formal methods, uh, digital twins and so forth. There's a whole range of computational tools. And so one program that we are sort of thinking towards for the future is about basically changing the nature of the scientific method by linking computational approaches with scientific discovery in a, in a broader way. And so the idea is not just sort of data analysis or data science at the end of an experiment, but what would you do if uh, computational approaches could actually help you automatically generate the hypothesis, not just sort of do some computation to check the hypothesis at the end. So this is where we're thinking. Uh, we know that there's other international funding. For example, Schmidt Features has given out funding in this AI for science area. Um, but we think it's an important and, again, a multi-directorate approach that needs more attention. So stay tuned there. So the third theme is about socio-technical systems and, uh, and sort of benefits of that sort. One thing that I wanted to home in on here is sustainability. Uh, and we see sustainability as uh, sort of a bi-directional flow. Uh, so on the left-hand side is sustainability in computing. And this is cleaning up our own house, right? This is saying computing itself should be more environmentally friendly. The right-hand side is using computing techniques to uh, advance sustainability for society. So the right-hand side says, let's use computer systems to optimize logistics to improve transportation energy usage, for example. The left-hand side says, Let's clean up the, the uh, environmental aspects of those computer systems that we're using. The two uh, leverage off each other and cycle off each other. Um, and uh, those of you who, who know a little bit about me know that I have done a lot of power efficient computing work over the years. Um, but my colleagues smile and say, Margaret, it's not just power efficiency, right? 
This is about full embodied carbon footprint from start to finish. And actually what you see in computer systems is that a lot of the non-green aspects of a computer system are in how they're fabricated, the energy used to design them, uh, and, the, and the implications of life cycle issues when you have to discard them at the end. So what are we doing here? Uh, what we're doing on this left-hand side on design for environmental sustainability and computing is we tested the waters with what's called a, a DCL, a Dear Colleague Letter, where we went out to the community and we said, if you have ideas in this broad space, come to us. Um, I don't know if, if uh, you can see this well enough here, but one of the things that we can do is we can analyze our award portfolio for topics. And so this might look like, I don't know what, the Hawaiian Islands over here, but it's actually a topic map. Um, and this bullseye is that before we did this DCL, we had a lot of work on energy management of computer systems and relatively little elsewhere. So the goal of this DCL was to encourage the community to think about sustainability more broadly than energy management. So we put the DCL out and we were able to fund, as a test, uh, testing the waters, we were able to fund nine projects. You can see them here. So yes, there's some energy management here. But there's also things like how do we make user interfaces that are uh, sort of intrinsically more uh, sust sustainable and energy aware? How do we repurpose smartphones to avoid the sort of uh, end of lifetime landfill impact of them? And how do we do sustainable reuse and disposal of uh, large scale cyber infrastructure as well? So a wide variety of programs in these nine. Um, so that tested the waters and we could tell that the community was ready to think about these things. And so just in the past month, we have released uh, a new program solicitation for a program in this area. And so you'll often see that sort of DCL first to test things out and then program later. So this new program builds on the DCL. It asks people to think about high risk, high reward ideas. It asks people to think about sustainability well beyond just energy. Um, and it asks people to think across many divisions. Um, there's three types of awards, small, medium, and workshop. And so the workshop is basically get folks together to think about uh, possible topic areas to engage a broad community. I hope that uh, you might sort of encourage your US colleagues to think about workshops in a broad set of topic areas, including the ComSonets areas, and um, sort of build on those as well as on the sort of more direct funding. And you can see the deadlines coming up in about three months. So that's the three technical theme areas. I'm gonna switch gears now at the end to talk a little bit about infrastructure and about people. I call these the how to get there um, buckets, if you will, because they cross cut all the technical topic areas. So infrastructure, uh, I think one of the big uh, things that I like to stress is we, as a community, we have often at times acted like we didn't need much infrastructure for our research. Don't mind me, I'll just simulate something on my laptop and I'll be okay, right? Um, but really, and meanwhile, the physicists are like, I need, a new, I need a new telescope now, I need a new particle accelerator now. We need infrastructure too. And we need it across our topic areas. So if you look at the kinds of themes that I've been talking about, each one of those has sort of natural, well-aligned infrastructure that goes with it. I talked about the semiconductor fab access that we're now starting to help support through that Dear Colleague letter. We also have um, access to quantum platforms, uh, cloud-connected quantum systems. And I'd be happy to talk about that offline with anyone who's going down that, that line. AI has huge infrastructure needs right now in terms of large scale training, large language models, data, and so forth. And then the, the socio technical systems, that's a very broad research area, but it has needs for infrastructure as well. So, what we try to do with our community is number one, tell them about infrastructure that exists that they can use, that we fund. And number two, encourage them to write infrastructure proposals to propose what's the next piece of infrastructure that we should fund. So in terms of infrastructure that exists that we can use, uh, here's one. And uh, I will say that, that this infrastructure is available to any academically affiliated researcher worldwide. So 
I am told, I haven't tested it, but I am told that you could log in today and, and start using these. Uh, so the URL is advancedwireless.org. So what are these? These are intended to be at scale test beds for experimenting with different parts of the advanced wireless research space. Uh, so the powder test bed is up and running. It does software defined networks and massive MIMO in a, in a urban slash campus setting. Um, there's uh, high end simulators through Cosmos. And the most recent of the test beds is uh, one that's aimed at rural connectivity it, uh, led by Iowa State University in the middle of the US in, in uh, the state of Iowa. So these are large scale private partner, private public partnerships with companies donating in-kind resources and several federal agencies uh, contributing as well. So that's one. And I hope, I, I hope that you will consider these all to be extensions of your lab. Uh, the, the next thing that I'm showing here, I call it my happily crowded map. Um, it's, it's crowded because there's a fair number of resources and we're proud of that. Uh, and it's, it's uh, happily crowded because we're happy that these are available for the research community to use. So the ones in green are the uh, power test beds that I already mentioned, these advanced wireless research test beds. Uh, the ones in uh, Navy and Teal are innovation class uh, computing systems and leadership class computing systems. So these are essentially high-end computers that you can access through uh, an allocation and, and application system. Uh, and then run high-end, different kinds of high-end supercomputing uh, problems on them. Uh, Frontera was a major contributor to COVID-19 research over the past three years. Another interesting one is uh, Neocortex at Pitt, which is, uses the Cerebrus wafer scale engine. So it's a very novel um, piece of hardware. If you've ever been curious to try out these pieces of hardware, uh, there are opportunities to do so through um, this network. The other thing I will say is the red ones are all cloud computing resources, including Cloud Bank, which any US researcher can get a Cloud Bank account and get modestly discounted uh, commercial cloud cycles from Azure, from AWS, from Google. Um, and it's, it's basically a way to streamline and encourage people to use cloud cycles rather than setting up yet another sort of local cluster. So this is a set of resources. There's some URLs at the bottom of this slide and we'd be really happy to see all these resources get as much use as possible. So that was infrastructure, quick tour there. I'm gonna talk a little bit about people and then I'll talk a little bit about partnerships. So people is important because you don't go anywhere, you don't get very many trees built if you aren't really engaging the full broadest population in, in the opportunities that are there. And I think every country deals with different aspects of how do we make sure that there are opportunities for everyone everywhere. Um, in the US, we've worked hard at NSF uh, for many years on broadening participation in STEM. And a key part of that for size has been a, a set of what we call BPC programs or broadening participation in computing programs. One thing that I wanted to note is we've been working on a, an effort for the past five years now that asks for the whole community to engage in BPC efforts. It shouldn't be sort of a sideline for a few people. It should be for everyone. And so for every proposal that gets sent to our directorate at uh, a medium or large level, so 600K or up, we ask that, that proposer to say, what are you gonna do about broadening participation in computing? Um, so we basically ask the whole community to take this on together. Now, if you ask a whole bunch of people what they're gonna do on a topic, you're gonna get a mishmash of ideas. They could be very good ideas, but they're probably not gonna be aligned. So how can we actually move the needle more productively? Um, what NSF has done is stood up a set of department and campus and national level resources for people to be able to plug into. And so hopefully every PI can look in that menu of resources and say, okay, I see myself here. Here's something for encouraging folks from low socioeconomic status to engage in computing. Here's something for more women in computing. Here's something for people from rural areas to engage in computing. Hopefully you see yourselves in the opportunities and know where to plug in. 
And so that's what we're asking of the community, is this ability to find an element that is meaningful and that you're willing to push on so that together we can change the face of what computing looks like. So this set of resources is housed at a URL, bpcnet.org. And you know, while we intend for that to be a resource for people who are proposing to NSF, anyone's welcome to take a look and see what's there. There's a lot of good ideas starting to collect there. And we also offer things like office hours for people who want to get help in working on these things. So the last part I'm going to talk about is partnerships. Uh, one key partnership that I mentioned uh, that has real international implications and then I'll sort of re-mention here, is the COVID-19 HPC Consortium. Uh, so this was founded in March 2020. That's a little mind-blowing to me. But like March 2020, there was a whole lot going on that month, if you'll recall. And so the idea that so quickly NSF and IBM and the U.S. Department of Energy together as a threesome co-founded an international public-private partnership to say, we know we are going to need compute cycles to advance our understanding of what's going on. And so let's get those compute cycles ready so that the scientists can come in with their studies. Uh, so it was founded in March 2020. It grew to have 40 consortium members in a dozen countries with huge computing resources and multiple of the um, Gordon Bell special prizes for supercomputing related to, to COVID uh, have gone to scientists that made use of this computing consortium. Where we're going next with this is that this has now evolved towards a national strategic computing reserve. The notion that for all kinds of emergencies, there's a moment where you might want to turn on computing resources or repurpose computing resources to be able to do things like analyze for extreme weather events, analyze uh, uh, different kinds of urgent computing scenarios, uh, so we're now uh, actually looking to hire someone to lead a pilot program office in this area. So this is one example we're proud of, of a broad international public-private partnership um, that has demonstrated real value to the world in terms of advancing understanding of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Another international partnership, um, many of you may have participated in this one, is the US-India collaborative research efforts over the, over the past year noticeably and actually longer term discussions that predated all of that. So in February, 2022, we issued a Dear Colleague letter and we said, we're offering supplemental funding. If you are a US researcher with NSF funding and you have a collaborator in India that you wanna collaborate with, we're offering this opportunity. On the Indian side, they, the opportunities were organized through the tech innovation hubs. Um, and we funded 35 of those uh, joint US-India projects at various funding levels. We're working towards what's next, hopefully um, towards something that is uh, a little bit more enduring. In terms of the overall goal of international collaborations, what is our goal? Our goal is to advance science. Uh, and our goal is to help U.S. researchers access resources that those collaborations might offer to them. And our goal is to support the desire for researchers across country borders to, to collaborate. We know how important that is um, to, to many aspects of science. So for the um, international collaborations that are size related, we have a web page where we keep the active ones. And you can sort of see either the country list or the topic list that's there. And I will say that for everything that you see on the active page, there's aspirations for more to be there, and there's discussions for more to be there. And so it's something that we certainly hope to see um, sustain and grow over the years. So uh, with that, I thought I would end not with some grand conclusion, but with a few possible discussion starters, um, or insert your question here, I'm happy. Uh, to take those questions. It's been a delight to get to talk with you today. And thank you very much for your time and your attention. I don't know how we're doing on time. Do we have time? Uh, I, I think we definitely have time for a few questions. 
So uh, thanks, Margaret, for a wonderful journey through size. I mean, I left uh, NSF about two years ago, and it seems like uh, there's been full steam ahead since then. Uh, questions? Uh, Thank you very much for a very <clears throat> insightful and interesting presentation. Uh, the one question I have uh, is that in the funding process, when a professor has a paper written, but the, the professor, the story is over, they go on to the next paper. On the other hand, you've talked about impact. So how does NSF ensure impact? Uh, so how does, the question is, uh, you know, you write a paper and maybe the story's over and how does NSF ensure impact? That's a great question. Um, and I, I think there's a few answers. So one is maybe the paper isn't the end of the story for you or for your students. Maybe because I'm, I'm guessing that uh, many folks continue to advocate for their work, to see about ways that they might reach out to companies or to open source communities to take it further. And so I think there are ways in which there's sort of sustaining cycles outside the funding agency role uh, where that impact occurs. Um, on the funding agency side, we do have some uh, mechanisms. I didn't talk about them here today. But we have mechanisms for what we call uh, transition to practice or tech transfer kinds of awards. And the goal there is to try to uh, foster, help researchers with that next step. So for example, a, a good example program there from NSF right now is called Pathways to Enable Open Source Ecosystems, or POSE. And POSE basically recognizes that a lot of what we do as a community is getting put out as open source something, open source software, open source hardware, open source protocols. Um, POSE basically says that the moment you click public on your GitHub repo, that shouldn't be the end of the story. You have to build an ecosystem in order to really grow something and have impact. And POSE is about funding people to help build the ecosystem around something that's open source. So that's an example where NSF is trying to catalyze and cultivate impact. Um, the other thing that we work hard on is uh, those stories, like just learning about the impact that we've had over a long period of time is non-trivial often. To be able to follow um, people and impact stories through um, multiple authors, multiple awards is tricky, but we're trying to get better and better at that um, using both uh, sort of databases and, uh, and award searches that we can do in-house and also, frankly, reaching out to the community and asking them for impact stories often as well. If I may add to that, there are also things like the Small Business Initiative, SBIR programs, where you know, startups get funded. So out of universities, you can get uh, small amounts of money if you really need to. Again, if you want to take that paper you wrote uh, beyond just the paper, there's a, there's mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, all of that. There's a question in the back there. <laughs> Thank you for a very insightful talk. Uh, you mentioned about $1 billion funding for CIMC. Uh, how much of that actually comes from industry? And what kind of uh, mechanisms do you have for industry to co-fund perhaps uh, research and also partner with NSF in identifying appropriate areas for funding? IBM you mentioned, but is that a systematic approach uh, to get industry? Ah, that's a great question. So the question was, of the one billion, how much comes from industry and how do we partner with industry? So the, the one billion that I showed on that slide is our federal appropriation from Congress. So that one billion is federal money. What I didn't show on that slide is that um, our best estimate is that for the most recent fiscal year, we had about $100 million of additional partnership money, which comes either from other federal agencies who partner with us for example, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is a really strong partner in our AI Institutes program, and they fund things like climate smart agriculture. Um, but then some of that $100 million is also industry funding of things like AI Institutes. We have a RINGS program, Resilient Intelligent Next G Systems, which is very much in the ComsNet's topic area. RINGS has nine industry partners that are all contributing. I like to think about it. There's one bucket. NSF pours some money into the bucket. The companies pour some money into the bucket, and there, thereby we have more resources by which to fund meritorious awards. Uh, so 
we do these industry partnerships for the most part on a program level. We uh, seek out companies who uh, have well-aligned goals and who are interested in sort of uh, sharing those resources to advance the research um, more than could be done by NSF alone. And uh, I didn't hear your affiliation. So if you want to talk more about partnerships, we'd be happy to. Uh, you know, we are partners with uh, of these companies, not Ola, sorry, we'll, we'll work on you. Now, uh, IBM, Google, Cisco, and Microsoft have all partnered with us in different ways. My affiliation is Indian Institute of Science. Wonderful. Meeting tomorrow. Great. Okay, um, go ahead. I'm um, the last yeah. Bakchi from Purdue. Thank you for the great talk. Um, you mentioned these resources that are made available, computational resources, data repositories. Is it feasible uh, to make any of these computational resources available across geographic boundaries? For example, a faculty in India wants to access the Anvil supercomputer, which is at Purdue. Is there any way to make such things available? Uh, that's a great question. So I know that power is available to academics worldwide. So the platforms for advanced wireless research test beds, which was the slide before the map, that is available to academics worldwide. I'd have to check on um, the, the resources that are accessible through the access program, um, how international collaborations work on them. I don't Got know it. the answer offhand, but if Thank you email me, I'll find out. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, we've closed the session. Thanks so much, uh, Margaret, for coming. Uh, here's a little plaque. And see you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all of us. So quick announcement for what happens next. We'll have a very uh, a shorter tea break. This room will be divided into smaller sigmas. So, uh, and then we will, at the same time, have demos, I believe, in Indian Affairs and later on uh, posters poolside. So please do not forget to see our amazing demos and, and, and posters too that are happening one floor below us. So thank you all. Enjoy your tea.